Welcome everyone to my annual cartoon ranking list, 2021 edition. 2021 was a great year for animation, Eastern and Western. So many amazing shows and movies. However, I'm mostly going to focus on the Western side because that's what my channel's about. But also, I think this is the last big ranking list of the year I'll do. Starting from 2022, I won't watch every single cartoon of the year, and I will only watch ones I'm actually interested in. Frankly, I don't see the use in watching cartoons I know I'll dislike. But for now, enjoy the video. Number 59, the bottom of the list and the worst cartoon of 2021 is The Red 8 Family. Not only is this easily the worst cartoon of 2021, but it may be the worst cartoon ever created. Yeah, it's somehow worse than the Nutshack and Vin and Slimpy adult party cartoon combined. See, this show is based on those ugly monkey NFTs. If you don't know what NFTs are, think of it like this. You paid a lot of money to own the Mona Lisa, but you also burned down the Amazon rainforest when you do. That's basically NFTs. They're ugly and they're bad for the environment. The animation is some of the worst I've ever seen. So janky and unfocused. Not to mention the unprofessional voice acting, blatant racist jokes, and spelling errors. Avoid this show like the plague. Number 58, The Prince. This is worse than the average ugly adult cartoon. This show is utterly tasteless with its jokes about the royal family, including the child. The art style is grotesque, basically the British version of our cartoon present. Oof. There's a reason why political newspaper cartoons should not be animated. This show was made just because Gary Janetti, who's also known for Family Guy, hates the royal family. Well, just well. Number 57 is Santa Inc. <sighs> Poor Rankin Bass. They made some pretty iconic stop motion Christmas specials, and now everyone makes fun of them. Santa Inc. shows zero respect for the craft of stop motion and is incredibly unfunny with its dated political jokes and just immature, grotesque stuff. Also, the same old cynical jokes. I think I speak for everyone when I say, we don't need cynicism right now. The world is bad enough as it is. We don't need to re be reminded of that everywhere we go. Also, the show is basically white activism in the series. The characters complain about white males, but guess what? All of the show's writers are white. How about actually helping minorities instead of making performative so-called jokes like these? Making minorities look bad. However, a lot of hate for this show has been rather anti-Semitic, so please don't make mean comments about Jewish people in criticizing the show. I'm like, feel free to criticize this show, but if you stoop to making fun of the creator's religion, yeah, you're a garbage human being. Number 56 is 10 year old Tom. I'm not sure what everyone sees in the show because it got surprisingly good reviews. To me, the art style is very unappealing and the humor is dry. Drier than a saltine cracker. Maybe I just don't understand the show's humor. Is this supposed to be bad on purpose like 12 ounce mouse or something? I'm not sure, but either way, the series is definitely not for me. Number 55 is Superhero Kindergarten. Genius Brands is a very shady company. They hire employees to show for their own products and silence any and all criticism. Plus, they're profiting off Stanley's death by making NFTs based on him and apparently he made this show before he died. Superhero Kindergarten is how not to make a preschool show. Just because it has Arnold Schwarzenegger on board does not make it a good show. The animation and lip-syncing leave a lot to be desired, as do the character design. Seriously, why do you make a black kid look gray? He's not a homestuck troll. Why don't you color black people correctly? You did it with the girl. I can't remember her name. Be consistent. The voices don't suit the characters either. And the show teaches nothing to its audience. Seriously, a farting hero? Get a grip. Hero Elementary is a much better show, so watch that instead. Number 54 is Thomas and Friends All Engines Go. <sighs> Mattel, how could you? 
All Engines Go is a huge insult to the Thomas franchise. Even Britt Allcroft, Christopher Audrey, and Veronica Chambers, uh, that's Reverend Audrey's daughter, have criticized it. It takes away everything that made the original Thomas so special. It's rapid fire, unrealistic in regards to railways, babifies the characters, even Diesel, who is now a good guy for some reason, and plays it like a generic preschool show, and has no variety in its characters. Thomas is the focus of every single episode. Focus on the other characters for once. Sheesh. So many people love the old Thomas because it stands out from the crowd, but it's calm place and strong characterization. Congratulations, Mattel, you alienated Thomas's niche audience. Number 53 is Housebroken. Now, I have to give credit where credit is due. It's nice that there's a Fox animated show that isn't a family sitcom for once, but it's still not particularly my cup of tea. The jokes just didn't land, and I found the characters highly forgettable and the premise boring. But if you like it, that's fine. I'm just surprised that I managed to get renewed for a second season. <laughs> Dear Squad, not exactly my cup of tea either, but again, if you like it, that's fine. I didn't find the show particularly remarkable either. It's another Paw Patrol clone, but made in China, literally. However, I do like that Nick Jr. is investing in foreign animation outside of Canada for once. And the show has dear characters too, but they're not very memorable. I especially do not like the villain of the show, I think his name is Sir Steel. I found his dub voice to be rather annoying. Where is the dub recorded anyway? Maybe it's one of those shows where the, the dub and the sub are recorded in the same place. Then again, it's probably the point that he's annoying, so you root for the heroes. <laughs> Number 51 is Camp Coral, Spongebob's Under Years. It exists. Yeah, that's it. It exists. The controversy surrounding the show was pretty stupid. Immediate, even I fell for it uh, back in 2019. You guys should really stop putting it. Uh, words in a dead man's mouth. You didn't know Steven Hellberg personally, so you can't speak for him. Anyways, uh, that controversy aside, it's really nothing special. I wouldn't be surprised if it gets forgotten about in three years. The animation leaves a lot to be desired. It's expressive, but the lighting and shading make it look half baked. Camp Lazlo is way better than this. Number 50 is Modok. Wow, so for Marvel's first adult animated show, you take a somewhat forgettable villain and give him a stereotypical family sitcom. Stop motion animation is nice and all, but the jokes don't land and the plot is very incoherent, mostly consisting of random events that have nothing to do with each other. It sometimes felt like I was watching Robot Chicken, not to mention the abundant, uh, stock, tired, family stereotypes like the bratty teenage daughter who hates her family. <sighs> Give me a break. Number 49 is Dino Ranch. It also exists. It's passable enough for kids to watch, I suppose, but is generally unremarkable and doesn't really stand out from the crowd. The characters are happy-go-lucky goody two-shoes and they learn life lessons. Where have we seen that before? Oh, when dinosaurs would never went extinct. There was so much potential here, people. I really want to take a deep dive into lore of the show. Perhaps I should make an edgy reboot of this. Just kidding. Or am I? Number 48 is Tom and Jerry in New York. Remember the Tom and Jerry show from 2014? No, me neither. Well, they sort of revived it with Tom and Jerry New York, which has the exact same animation style and still plays it too safe, which is an issue with a lot of Tom and Jerry media as of late. Oh, and it's made to promote the mediocre live action movie, so go figure. Big Warner Bros. cartoon franchi franchises like this and Scooby Doo are kept on a pretty tight leash. And while the experimentation isn't bad, the recent media ends up being quite dull and bland, and the hardships behind the scenes don't help matters. 
This show could have a lot more potential, it just needs a bigger budget. I wish they made more Tom and Jerry special shorts. The shorts are some of the best Tom and Jerry content we've got recently. It's by the same people who did Looney Tunes cartoons. Number 47 is Little Elf. This was definitely a fascinating villain origin story. But seriously, celebrity cartoons are a thing in the past. Stop trying to bring them back. Granted, the show was announced before Ellen DeGeneres got exposed for being racist and mistreating her employees, but still, it's a huge shame. If this show weren't tied to Ellen, it would be a legitimately cute show. It does have good lessons and pretty nice artwork, but it's all undermined by Ellen's real-life actions. Number 46 is Chicago Party Aunt. This show received a lot of hatred for apparently being based on Twitter account. Uh, the details are a bit fuzzy, but when I sat down and watched it, it honestly wasn't that bad. Granted, it's not good either, which is why it's still in the relatively low area on this list. This show wouldn't be as tolerable as it is to me if it weren't for Lauren Ash's great performance as its usual aunt. Uh, you may remember her for voicing Scorpio on She-Ra. Number 45 is Q-Force. The initial teaser trailer was awful. Even the makers of the show admitted that. But the show itself wasn't that bad. It does have good artwork, decent spy music, and even emotional moments at times. So it's not just a 24-7 queer stereotype parade. As a queer person myself, the show is okay, I suppose. But definitely not the pinnacle of LGBTQ fiction, as it's extremely lowbrow. I hate Twink so much, yes, that's his name. Twink. Number 44 is Bird Girl. This show has almost nothing to do with Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law, and it shows. The humor is very hit or miss, mostly miss, and the episodes are way too dragged out. However, like with Q-Force, this show does have some pretty deep moments that are admittedly well written. And the show isn't completely unwatchable because Paget Brewster, I hope her, I said her name right, is just so charming. Just somewhat of a snooze fest, but believe me, you are m much better off watching Tuka and Birdie. <laughs> Number 43 is Chicken Squad. Another show at Animals Rescuing Novitors, yay! As I noted in my review of the series, it does manage to stand out from the crowd just a bit by having a unique twist on the usual tropes. For example, the girl, Sweetie, is also the strongest of the team. We need more characters like that in preschool shows. It's just that the lessons are the typical ones you see over and over, like, work together. Pretty much every single preschool show is taught that, uh, you could do something else. Something that preschool shows don't always do. There's plenty of options out there, people. Number 42 is CGI Human. I will be calling this show Deflated Adam to differentiate it from Masters of the Universe Revelations. The reason why I call it Deflated Adam is because the character designs are highly underwhelming. For example, Adam looks like Adrian Agrest, and he man looks like he took a lot of steroids. That said, it does take a unique approach to the franchise by giving it a science fiction angle, but it probably won't capture kids' attention. It seems like the show was made just so Mattel could pump out an extra something He-Man related so they wouldn't lose the license. In other words, an Ash can copy. Number 41 is The Patrick Star Show. It's more watchable than Camp Coral, but that's not saying much. It's been proven time and time again that comedy reliefs, such as Patrick, work best in small doses, and when you give them their own spin-off, it gets very grating very fast. There are plenty of positives, though. I like how they redesigned Patrick's parents, Cecil and Bunny. They look much more fun and unique than they used to. And the animation is good as always. Number 40 is The Harper House. I went into this show thinking it was gonna suck, but it honestly wasn't so bad. It was actually kind of good. The art is highly mediocre, yes, but there was good music, some compelling writing, and it doesn't recycle the same stock family sitcom tropes. Unfortunately, it was cancelled after one season, but I think it would have been more successful had it been live action, since 
honestly, it didn't really use animation to its advantage. Number 39 is Go Duck Go. You know, it's pretty basic as far as kid shows go, but it's good for kids. I mean, it's it does have some pretty good animation and nice music and nice voice acting. Pretty decent show for kids. And I really had to give kudos to The Crow for making a whole show out of a pretty simple kids book. Hmm, maybe next I should adapt Are You My Mother? Number 38 is the Johnny Test Revival. As I stated in my reaction to the show, it is much better than its predecessor. It improves upon its flaws by having slick, fluid animation, actually funny jokes, and tolerable sound design so you won't hear the lip crack every 5 seconds. In fact, in one episode they make fun of the lip cracks. If you dislike the original Johnny Test, you might be pleasantly surprised by the new show, and of course you're a fan, you'll enjoy it too. Number 37 is Chippendale Park Life. I have to give credit where credit is due. The animation and art style is superb, and the lack of dialogue will give it better international exposure. Zulon made this show. They're a French company that specializes in cartoons with no dialogue, like Augie and the Cockroaches. Since they have no dialogue, there's no need to dub them, and they are incredibly successful worldwide. However, it's still relatively low on the list because I can't stand the sound design. The voices. I mean, the gibberish and the music it really hurts my ears. If you have sensitive hearing, you, sh you sh probably shouldn't watch this. Number 36 is a new Smurf show. This was actually supposed to be lower on the list, but for some reason I placed it here and it's too late to go back, so deal with it. Anyways, this is a loose sequel of sorts to Smurfs The Lost Village, and on the whole, the show is pretty nice animation, and I appreciate that Smurfette isn't a damsel in the stress like she usually is. But there are some weak jokes, and the dub voices are a bit weird. Maybe that's because both the sub and the dub are recorded in Belgium, but what can you do? Number 35 is Mickey Mouse Funhouse. Out of all three of the Mickey preschool shows, I'd say this one is the best. It doesn't have down to the audience, it's pretty entertaining and six to its gimmick, unlike Roadster Racers. It even has some pretty introspective things at times, like in Mickey the Brave, which examines what exactly needs to be good or bad. Although I'm not really fond of Funny, the titular Funhouse. They should have brought back Toodles for all I care. Number 34 is Gabby's Dollhouse, the Mother House. Like Blue's Clues, it cleverly blends live action and animation. It's quite comforting and has good lessons for kids. My favorite character is Cat Rat because he's hilarious and brings a bit of cynicism to what would otherwise be a very sugary show. Number 33 is the Rugrats reboot. Once you get past the admittedly sort of creepy and rudimentary CGI, it's just like the original Rugrats. I mean, the adventures they go on are so enjoyable and all of the babies are still in character. I clarified the babies because some of the changes they made to the adults are might be a bit divisive. For example, they made Grandpa Lou into a hippie instead of a crotchety old war veteran. I don't mind this change myself, but some others might not like it. Number 32 is High Guardian Spice. This show really isn't that bad. Contrary to what outrage culture weeb channels say, I bet they're secretly fans of the show because they talk about it non-stop. Like, if you hate it, let it go, but you're not. Hmm. Anyways, it's just bland and inoffensive at worst, but the art is pretty cute, the music is relaxing, but I do agree that the voice acting needs a lot of work because almost all of the cast have no acting experience. And there are a lot of cliches. Magic school, mean popular girl, happy go, happy go lucky protagonist, all that sort of stuff. Snapdragon is the highlight of the show. Number thirty one is Dogs in Space. It wasn't particularly keen on this at first, but I went back to watch four episodes, and it grew on me. 
I enjoyed the soundtrack and some of the humor, even if the writing was a bit too self-aware post-modern at times. I can't really explain it, but you'll know it when you watch it. It's kind of a problem with a bunch of cartoons as of late. The character designs are cute, but they're pretty uh, bog standard. I had to do a double take and make sure I wasn't watching the first season of Infinity Train. Number 30 is Aquaman, King of Atlantis. Pretty funny and serviceable miniseries, all things considered. Just a fun little unique take on Aquaman with explosive animation. The crew, uh, was trying to find their footing with Thunder Cats or they also made that show, and I can say here, they massively improved from TCR. And everyone else seems to be on the same page, since it didn't get as much backlash as TCR. And a bit more praise, too. Number 29 is The Great North. Yeah, it is a Fox Family sitcom, and it does have the same watch style as Bob's Burgers, but this is actually one of the better shows on animation domination right now. And when you look past the g admittedly generic art style, you will easily get hooked on the characters, even with their own established personality, struggles, and motivations. Plus, the Alaska setting provides many plot opportunities and a unique perspective. Not a lot of shows take place in Alaska, but this one does. And it does have some good background artwork, like with the Aurora Borealis in Episode 1. Number 28 is Hitmonkey. There's a lot to like about this show. I like the Yakuza plot and themes, the music, and Hitmonkey himself. The music is perfect for a show set in Japan, but the show could be better. The art is good in frames, but not so much in motion. It's kind of choppy, and it makes the fight scenes feel less impactful. Also, Bryce, I found it to be a very annoying character. Nonetheless, it is unironically one of my favorite Marvel shows of this year. Number 27 is Inside Job. I will admit this, I respect it way more than I like it. I actually found the show itself to be met, and it's only high up so people won't get mad at me for putting it lower on the list. Anyways, um, while it does have some good ideas, and Reagan was a very charming character, the writing was rather insufferable. Why? Because it's filled with too much of that quirky postmodern writing. You'll know when you watch it. And, uh, too many pop culture references. Also, there was a very ableist scene in episode 3 where, um, Reagan's mom makes fun of her for having, uh, Asperger's. No, they shouldn't say Asperger's. It's autism spectrum disorder. Asperger's is discredited because Hans Asperger was a Nazi. And making fun of someone for being autistic is disgusting. Number 26 is What If. I also respect this more than I like it. The actual show itself, well, it does have good ideas and very stylistic animation. I, it, it wasn't for me because I found it boring. However, it's way more dignified than other uh, adult cartoons, I guess. I don't know what I categorize this as. I think it's a a teen or young adult cartoon. I'm not sure, but it does feel more dignified and less immature than a lot of others. Number 25 is Spidey and his amazing friends. Yes, it does borrow a lot from PJ Mask, but it's not like it's a complete copy. It has a unique spin on the Spider-Man lore. I have to give props to them for not showing us Peter's backstory for the millionth time. The villains are pretty entertained because of how cheesy they are. Doc Ock would be far more sinister in any other production, but here she hands it up as a mere schoolyard bully with state-of-the-art technology and I love it. Plus, you can't go wrong with follow-up by contributing to the soundtrack. Number 24 is Ridley Jones. It mixes Night the Museum with Indiana Jones for a very entertaining show for kids. It's a tip for a young audience, but the clever dialogue, high stakes, and action makes me forget that the team from preschool was in the first place. Never underestimate your audience. Ridley and her friends all get a chance to be fleshed out in their spotlight episodes. 
And why I like that Fred the Bison is non-binary. I wish that we'd have human non-binary characters for once. Seems like almost all non-binary characters in Western animation are animals or aliens. Uh, yeah, it's weird. And for everyone complaining about uh, the mummy girl having two dads, look up homosexuality in ancient Egypt. It really isn't all that far-fetched. Number 23 is Star Wars The Bad Batch. When I watched the last season of The Clone Wars, I loved The Bad Batch and I thought they deserved their own show. And they finally got one. As always, the animation is cutting edge and Order 66 from the perspective of the clones is definitely a unique angle. I didn't even think Omega was that bad. But admittedly, the writing of the story did get shaky, which is why it's not higher on the list, along with the whitewashing controversy. Look up, um, Unwhitewash the Bad Batch to learn more. Number 22 is City of Ghosts, a super chill but artsy show set in San Francisco, talking about the different cultures of the area and their ghost stories. It's also got beautiful stylized animation that almost resembles stop motion. Just a very calming show to watch. If you want a show to relax to and appreciate the art of City of Ghosts is the show for you. Number 21 is Ada Twist Scientist. This show teaches about science and is highly clever with entertaining dialogue and stories. It's not overly saccharine. It's just the perfect amount of sweet and spicy. The show does a good job of conveying science lessons, asking questions, forming hypotheses, experimenting, and most importantly, teamwork. Number 20 is Karma's World. Another heartwarming cartoon with a black girl lead, this time driven by music and inspired by Ludacris's daughter, Karma Bridges. It focuses on friendship, family, loving yourself and others, and dealing with microaggressions. For example, in one episode, Karma's non-black friends make microaggressive comments about her natural hair. The animation is so detailed, the hair looks real. I think one of the only problems I have with the show, in fact the only one is that I can't really tell who the audience is. Is it preschoolers, older kids? Who knows? Not me. Number 19 is Teenage Euthanasia. A lot of people hate this show, but to be honest, it's one of my favorite things to come out of Adult Swim this year. Despite the crude art style, it is really is a hauntingly poignant, meaningful show. It revolves around the revived course of a teenage mother who now gets a chance to raise her unplanned child. Doesn't go for the cheap, easy, and overly offensive jokes that certain other adult cartoons do. Said took a deep look into Trophy's past life. Yes, that's her name, Trophy. Number 18 is Elliot from Earth. Everything about Elliot from Earth is so cinematic, from the theme music to the sparkly, vibrant animation. Even has a story arc, meaning that you get to watch all the episodes together like a movie but there's still some self ender episodes to balance it out, so it doesn't get too serious. I love the rela relationship between Elliot and his mom, Frankie. They have similar struggles in trying to please people and forge friendships due to them moving a lot, and now that they're in space with a bunch of wacky looking aliens who are as every bit as eccentric as them, they finally feel at home. Number 17 is Masters of the Universe Revelations. Even if you don't particularly care for the direction the story went, you can't deny that the animation itself is some of the most beautiful in all of Western cartoons. Powerhouse Animation also made the Castlevania series, which explains it. So much detail, so much action, and <coughs> great voice performances, especially Mark Hamill as Skeletor. Deflated Adam may be for young kids, but if you're up, sensible Order Masters of the Universe fan, you'll probably appreciate a uh, revelation. Number 16 is Wolf Boy and the Everything Factory, a hidden gem on Apple TV+. It's so comforting, just like Hilda on Summer Camp Island. Some plot points may seem familiar, and the animation is a bit choppy at times, but it's got pretty well-written world-building and serious character expansion. And I just adore the show's theme of embracing being weird. 
Number 15 is Harriet the Spy, another hidden gem on Apple TV+. If you miss 2000s cartoons, you should watch this show because it has blatant 2000s vibes with its wacky plots, punk theme song, usage of payphones, and other archaic technology, and emphasis on hand-drawn lines in the animation. The overall aesthetic and feel of the show is something that recent animation has been sorely lacking. Proves that you don't need to have some grand story in order to be a great show. Number 14 is Dub Days, the much awaited series based on Up. These are bite sized episodes that are wholesome, hilarious, and relaxing, and with animation as good as the original movie. Even though it is a mere five episodes and they won't make any more because of Ed Asner passing away, it's still worth a watch if you are feeling down or tired. A ray of sunshine in our dark world. Number 13 is I Heart Arlo, which is based on the movie Arlo the Alligator Boy. Both of these are really underrated and you should check them out. I know, I know, they use stock tropes you've seen before, but it's not 100% predictable. None of the characters are lovable. My favorite is Alia the Tiger. Each of the episodes have unique self-contained stories, but they all tie into one bigger story. The characters get into wacky hijinks and have opportunities to be fleshed out. Number 12 is The Snoopy Show. Yet another Apple TV Plus cartoon. I must say that Wild Brain and Apple Peanuts cartoons are actually really good. They feel true to the classic Peanuts cartoons with their jazz piano music, and the animation does its best to replicate the feel of the old cartoons. And the show's vignette, slice of life format allows for more stories than just Snoopy all the time. You can see more characters like Sally. Linus, Schroeder, etc., who didn't do much in the previous show, Snoopy in Space. Number 11 is Alma's Way. This show, created by Sania Manzana, who played Maria on Sesame Street, takes place in the Bronx. It puts heavy emphasis on Puerto Rican culture. Aside from teaching about Latino culture, it also teaches us to stop and think the problems. Yes, Alma does talk to the audience, but she treats the viewer like a friend and speaks on their level and doesn't ask for their help. Nobody likes being talked down to, and thankfully, Alma avoids doing that. Number 10 is Monsters at Work. We're in the top 10 now! Anyways, while I found the show only decent when it first came out, it did get better over the course of Season 1. It's a direct continuation of Monsters, Inc. that leaves an impact on the first and second viewing. Got the same animation, the trademark jazz music, and the voice hatches to return, sure to delight fans. Yes, Tyler's main plot of learning to appreciate Mift is a pretty by-the-books trope. I was more interested in Tyler's attempts to become a jokester in Mike and Sully's subplots. Number 9 is Arcane. I don't play League of Legends, and I definitely don't plan to, but this show blew me away. By far the best aspect of the show is the animation, which is this gorgeous unique blend of 2D and 3D. Ambitious projects like these are what keep me glued to the world of Western animation. It's a prequel to League of Legends, retelling the characters' stories, but it can easily appeal to both people who don't play it and people who do. I found myself invested in these characters, their struggles, and a twisted war that ultimately boils down to sibling rivalry. The main theme of the show is war as hell. It ultimately corrupts. In the series, there is a drug that turns human beings into monsters, but not the, just the drug that turns people into monsters. Characters turn themselves into metaphorical monsters with war and violence. Number 8 is Centaur World. Like with Arcane, I wasn't expecting to like this at first because I didn't like the character designs. But it too blew me away. The best way I could describe the show is that it's like the cowboy beep of a western cartoon because it combines so many genres into one that it eventually becomes its own genre. There's action, comedy, adventure, drama, mysteries, and tons of musical songs. You might be annoyed with the centaur characters at first, but as you learn more and more about them, you grow to love them, like Horse did. Number 7 is Middlemost Post first original in-house Nick tune in a while, and has all the makings of a hit show. The animation is creative, expressive, and utilizes mixed media. 
Our three main characters are an unexpected trio, but work well with each other, and it has positive messages like, Parker is a rainforest rain cloud. He used to be a bad person, but he's becoming a good one. And I love messages that show no one is truly bad at heart about redemption and atonement. We need more shows like these. Number six is Maya and the Three. Jorge Gutierrez is one of the best cartoon creators of all time, with a unique visual style and dedication to Mexico. This miniseries is another one of his great projects, just ticks all the boxes. This is some of the most detailed CGI I've ever seen in a television series, to the point that I forget it's not a movie since it just looks so theatrical, and the characters play around with the black aspect ratio bars, it just pops! In just nine episodes, we get to know and love the complex, messed up cast of Maya and the Three. All the characters are presented as flawed, having a somewhat gray morality, and a lot of development, especially for Maya herself, who commits probably the most selfless thing I've ever seen in the series finale. Number 5 is Jellystone. In an era full of story-driven shows, it feels oddly refreshing to have a zany show with zero continuity. C.H. Greenblatt always delivers with his trademark writing and witty humor, despite all the changes made to these iconic Hanna-Barbera characters. There's so much care and dedication put into it. Jeff Bergman does a spot-on Edwin impression when voicing Wally Gator. Plus, there's hundreds of obscure Hanna-Barbera characters. Seriously. Nobody remembers the Catanooga Cats. The Jellystone crew reimagined them as evil animatronics. Whether you're a Hannibal Bear fan or not, Jellystone is sure to get more than a few laughs out of you. Number 4 is The Ghost and Molly McGee. Again, really refreshing to have a comedic zany cartoon with eye-popping animation, I swear. Mercury Filmworks always, always makes good animation. The show is basically like Beetlejuice, but more optimistic and musical. I love that the message is so positive and Molly is a joyous ray of sunshine. If you think all modern cartoons are bad, watch this and you'll be proven wrong. Number 3 is Trace. If you haven't watched this, go watch this. I'm serious. This is exactly what adult animation needs. This is an action horror show from the Philippines about Filipino folklore, and you can learn a lot about it when watching the series. Plus, the animation is mind-blowing. It's also great to have a show that's actually mature and treats heavy subjects with the weight they deserve. Number 2 is Invincible. Another saving grace for adult animation, and just like on how the show has become a worldwide phenomenon, I'm sure that we'll get more shows like this and Trace very soon. It could get quite bloody, but it also actually handles mature subject matter well, balances comedy and drama perfectly, and has interesting characters and suspenseful build-ups. You will remember every single character from the show, I promise you will. Number one is Kid Cosmic. The best cartoon of 2021 is created by Craig McCracken, and it just scratches that particular itch that's been missing for so long. A superhero show that isn't 100% ridiculous or 100% edgy, but just the right balance. The beautiful artwork, also provided by Mercury Filmworks, perfectly mimics old Silver Age Belgian comics, and every character has a deep, well-rounded personality. I especially love and relate to Kid himself. Another ray of sunshine just like Molly McGee. Plus, it's going to be going the Teen Titans route by having a story arc for one character per season. For example, season 1 Kid and season 2 Joe. Please watch the show, you definitely will be disappointed. Thank you for watching my ranking list for all the cartoons of 2021, or most of them anyways. And I just can't wait for what 2022 has in store. It's going to be yet another great year for animation. And thank you for watching this incredibly long video. I applaud your patience. And I appreciate all my subscribers. Peace out. And Happy New Year.